I forgot to put my mic on. Um, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, looks like we've got some rain going on right now. I have a feeling we're going to hear the roof a little bit this morning. Um, welcome to visitors and uh, friends of our congregation. You're always welcome here. I hope you know that. And uh, if there's any questions about this particular community of faith that I can answer or Pastor Wise can answer, uh, please let us know. We'd love to entertain those questions. People in our community that we continue to pray for uh, today, uh, folk in our care facilities, Betty Cease, Bob Long, Ruth Geralds, these are folk that need to be constantly in your prayers, and thank you for that. Dolores Keller, who was in a care facility, uh, is now back at home doing some of her rehab, so we're happy about that. Um, I just got word uh, on Thursday e evening, Friday morning, about Wayne Emelheins. He had some very sudden surgery that needed to take place. He's had that surgery, and he's back home already uh, recovering. But just wanted to make sure you were keeping the Emelheinses in your prayers as he recovers from that. Uh, we had our uh, community meal just, uh, uh, that we gave away yesterday at our second campus, St. Matthew's in Lockbourne. Uh, about 50 meals were served along with fresh produce and, and other supplies to people who were most in need, and we're happy to do that. Thanks to everybody who helps provide those meals, who helps serve and, and cooks those meals. Uh, we're getting ready to do that all over again here at this site. Bethel's Community Meal is this Saturday. Uh, Sign Up Genius is the place to go to check for food needs, if we have any food needs, and then after that, if you uh, want to volunteer in any way, shape, or form, I think there's a sign-up sheet or you contact the church office directly for that. Uh, so thanks for being uh, a part of those feeding ministries. We're always collecting on perishable food items as well. We're in the midst of emphasizing Lutheran World Relief health care kits. Those are, uh, well, you can see a display in the back so you know what to donate for those kits. Uh, and then... Uh, when it comes to our worship today, it's really raining a lot. I hope your windows are up. Um, when uh, it comes to our worship today, we're in, when we get to the prayers of of uh, intercession uh, after the or right before the Eucharist, uh, you're going to hear a petition during those prayers about praying for volunteers, and it lists a couple volunteers. That's always an inadequate list, right? We're just trying to note volunteers that help the church. We have volunteer upon volunteer doing all kinds of different things that certainly aren't listed in that prayer, but are extremely important to the life of our church and how things keep going. So thanks. It's a good excuse to just say thank you to all of our volunteers and that we do indeed keep you in our prayers in all those things that happen, those things seen and unseen. Uh, that are done every single day. So thank you very much. With all of that, let's take a moment, uh, have a prelude, and we'll begin worship. Thanks for being here.
If you'll please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth.
let us pray. O oh God, from you come all desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jerom with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jerom of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not to not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it, is the, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Moses answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from, the follow, the, from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The word, of the, God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 85 in unison together. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway. A reading from Ephesians. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, is, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption at his as his children through, through Jesus Christ, according to the, the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the, for, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, 
having been destined according, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Says Steve, uh, are you able to dim the lights a little bit for this reading? Just a little bit? Perfect. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said it's Elijah, and others said it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised." For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Thanks, Steve. I'd let you sit in the dark, but you'd fall asleep and I couldn't read my sermon, so it's a lose lose situation. Dearly beloved, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 
Before our son Andrew was born, and like most parents who are getting ready for the birth of a newborn, we painted his room, what was going to be his room. And we decided, because we're just so progressively educated, to paint his room red, uh, blue, and yellow, the primary colors, right? Let's get that whole thing out of the way. Except there's four walls to a room. So we had to throw green on one wall, too. I'm not sure if that's what ended up screwing him up. But anyway, um, <laughs> kidding. I love my son. Um, add to those colors the appropriate but probably questionable amount of soccer balls and Columbus crew paraphernalia, and you have a perfect baby room for the Ray family, for me, basically. <laughs> Now, for others, I get it's other themes, right? Other people, other parents do other things. Noah's Ark, maybe, uh, the alphabet, uh, some kind of Disney theme, um, Frozen, Sleeping Beauty. Although, if you go with Sleeping Beauty, I'd be careful about that. Um, in the end, how you decorate your kid's room probably doesn't matter. Jason, do you remember what your room was decorated when you were a baby? No, of course not. He doesn't remember. Jen probably doesn't remember. I don't know. It's probably different by now. Uh, um, my, my point is it probably doesn't matter because you're going to have parental guilt about it anyway. All right? And uh, the only way it might matter, though, I guess, is that if you would choose a theme that had anything to do with our gospel text for today. Like if you were looking for Herod wallpaper, don't do that. Not even on Amazon, don't do that. Children's services will be at your door the next day, probably. Now, I, I bring this up and I use this kind of introductory imagery and try to be funny a little bit, but you know what all that is? That's just a stalling tactic. That's a stalling tactic for a preacher who doesn't really want to deal with this cute little story right from our beloved Bible in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. How is any respectable pastor supposed to preach on this, let alone me? And in case you missed the details, in a nutshell, while we were sitting in the darkness, here's the details. Herod this is all historical fact. Herod is the ruler of this part of Israel at the time. All right? He goes to vacation in Rome, and he gets the hots for his brother's wife, who he then marries. John the Baptist suggests that maybe that's not okay. Now, oddly, Herod likes John as much as anybody can like a crazy bug-eating prophet who lives outdoors and speaks consistently of inconvenient truths. Truths such as it's not okay to marry your already married brother's wife. And that gets him arrested. It also, as you can imagine, got him on the bad side of Herod's new wife. Herodias, he didn't like John. And then when Herod throws himself this big birthday party, the daughter-in-law, Salome, dances for him, for him and all the other half-drunk generals and CEOs and celebrities who are there. Now, we, we don't know the exact nature of the dance, right? We just know she dances and it pleased Herod enough that he offered to give her anything up to half of his kingdom, which was a lot. And if that, in fact, is the case, I don't think she danced the chicken dance. Uh, not at all. So, Salome runs to her mom after this little whatever dance and says, what should I ask for? And her mom says, the head of John the Baptist. Herod found this disturbing. Clearly didn't want to do it, but the text says he went through it anyway. Why? Because of his oath, maybe. 
because he didn't want to disappoint his dinner guests. It doesn't really matter. By the end of the final course of Herod's birthday dinner, John the Baptist's head was on a platter. Head was on a platter. It's a gruesome tale. And as I said earlier, what in the world, what in the world can a preacher do with the text? I mean, it is a lousy, yeah, try to think of the things to do with it. It's a lousy morality tale, right? I mean, what's the moral of the story? There isn't any moral of the story. Uh, it's certainly not if your daughter dirty dances at your birthday party, don't cut off someone's head to make friends. That is not the moral of the story. And yet, as distant as that kind of gruesome story might seem to us, is that whole thing that distant and foreign to us? We live in an age, it seems to me, that is often as faithless and corrupt as Herod's. Beheadings still happen in our world. Lynchings still take place in our country. Those in power will do most anything. People still quickly divorce someone simply because they fall in love with someone else's wife or husband. And I myself, like Herod, have purposely distanced myself from people who have spoken truths to me that I'm not ready to face. Newsflash, young girls are still made to be sexual objects for powerful men. I have done or said things that hurt others just so I don't lose face with people I'm trying to impress. I know the details of this story that we read in the dark are horrific, but again, they aren't as removed from everything as we might think. What Herod did was despicable, there's no diminishing that, but maybe besides being an obvious villain, he's also a tragic figure. Tragic! Tragic because he knew better. Tragic because Herod wasn't some soulless, bloodthirsty, godless devil. He knew it was wrong, he knew it was wrong after it was done, and he had a guilty conscience. Because later on, and that's the very first part of this story, later on, when he hears about Jesus, why else would Herod assume of all things that the most logical explanation for why there was a man in his region who healed people, who cast out demons, was that it must be the guy he beheaded that had come back from the grave. That's a guilty person's assumption, straight up. He had a guilty conscience, which means he knew better, and he did it anyway, like he was stuck. Stuck in the story of his own writing. What's tragic is, if Herod went to his grave with all his violence and stupidity and sin on his conscience, never once knowing that he and his illegal wife and her child Salome and John the Baptist are all beloved children of God. All of them. What's tragic about Herod is how different he is from the prostitutes, the demoniacs, and the tax collectors, and the Pharisees, and the centurions we meet in all those other stories along the way in the Gospels. They encounter Jesus Christ in those stories. And they are freed from the bondage of their past. In the presence of Christ, they are given a glimpse of God's bigger story of love and mercy and are shown who they really truly are in the eyes of a loving God, and they are made new. The story of whom they are is giving a new ending, a new meaning. But Herod, Herod was trapped, trapped in his own story, and it feels to me like it's a story that tortured him, one from which he felt there was no escape. When our own little stories, your own little story, begins to feel a little self-contained, a little inescapable, uh, that's when things get tragic. Maybe on some level, on occasion, you feel that way, trapped 
unable to change the story of who you are, unable to change your behavior or attitude or outlook, so caught up in the events around you, so caught up in the identity that you've had for so long that it clings to you like a skin suit. And if that's true, <laughs> and if that's true, and you are hoping to hear for some good news today, I got to tell you, uh, there's no good news in this story today. There's no good news in the story that I read to you today. There's gospel. There's a difference between that, by the way. But there's no good news today in this text. I looked for it. I looked all week for it. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, maybe that's actually the point. So if you haven't heard anything I've said so far, listen right now. That may be the point. Maybe we're supposed to notice that this is the only story in Mark's gospel that we read all year. This is the only story in Mark's gospel where Jesus isn't part of the story. He's not mentioned. There's no Jesus. So if this story stood alone, there would be only sedition, sin, and violence, and bondage, and political move, maneuvering, and incest. The only thing that makes this story good is that it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. It's a great line from an, an old movie, The Best Exotic Marigold uh, Hotel. I don't know if any of you saw that movie, uh, in which a character says that there's a saying in India that in the end all will be well. And if all is not well, it's not yet the end. So while Herod and the story of Herod, in that there is no good news, and while there is no Jesus in this story, what's amazing is that the story of Herod's birthday and the beheading of John the Baptist is immediately followed in the Gospel of Mark by the feeding of the 5,000. The godless black mass of Herod's party is immediately followed by another party, a Eucharistic one in which there's no exploitation of children or killing of prophets. There's only Jesus. There's Jesus and thousands of people sitting on the green grass and a few loaves of bread and a couple of fishes. And they're all fed by what seems like not enough, and yet there were still baskets of fish and bread left over to share. They were living a new story, a story written by God, who desires that all are fed, all are loved, and none are exploited, and desires it so much that God offers us a reminder of this every single week right here. Right here at this Eucharistic table. This table is the antidote to whatever version of Herod's birthday party is playing out in our own lives and in the world around us. You aren't trapped. You're not. You're not trapped. God's still writing the story. And this time, and in this story, Jesus is the main character. Amen.
Join me now as we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, mighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy Parent, you welcome your people into one family and gather all things to yourself. Bestow your grace upon your beloved church, lavish your wisdom upon us, and redeem us from our faults, that by our witness all might praise your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Awesome Creator, you steadfastly tend to the smallest of seeds and the mightiest of sycamore trees. Spring up green growth from the earth, nour nourish the growth of fruit, grain, and other crops, and bless the work of farmers and laborers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the oppressed, turn the ears of those who are in power to the voices of prophets in our own day. Protect those who speak difficult truths when it is risky to do so. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of strength, you are near to those who endure difficulty. Comfort all who are survivors of violence, Guard the refugee and the immigrant, and protect all those who are victims of prejudice and discrimination. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of love, we pray for this holy house and all of those who worship here. We pray especially for those whose efforts beyond the scenes often go unnoticed. For the custodians and the maintenance workers, for our Alpha staff, and for all our volunteers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We thank you, God, for the saints, martyrs, and the prophets who have died in the faith. We remember those in this community who have recently died. United with them as God's children, assure us that we are yours forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your ab abiding grace. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share God's peace. God's peace.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places. Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and of every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. Amen.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now may the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.